I try pretty hard to find some interesting backdrops for my video and I have really succeeded this week. Check this out, oh man. My wife just fell over in the snow. <laughs> it's slippy. <laughs> Look at this backdrop, that's bloody ridiculous. I don't know if I'll ever be able to uh, get a backdrop as good as this again. This is by far my most requested video. I can't talk about America without numerous people leaving comments. What do you think about the Solutrean hypothesis? So here I am telling you what I think about the Solutrean hypothesis. And I'm not a big fan. For those that don't know, the Solutrean hypothesis is the idea that the first Native Americans, or at least a wave of Native Americans, arrived in the continent from Europe rather than Asia, which is the mainstream opinion. This gets a ton of media attention, it's a very popular theory outside of academic circles, but archaeologists in general don't like it. It's not supported by the vast majority of archaeologists. So I'm going to look at the different criticisms today, from the tools, to the chronology, to the geographical and climate evidence, and finally the genetic evidence, to look at the criticisms and see if it holds up under scrutiny. The cornerstone of the Solutrean hypothesis, it really rests on the similarities in how some stone tools produced by Clovis and Solutrean peoples were made. To produce their bifaces, they basically use the same technique. I'm no lithics guy, I'm no anything guy, I'm no expert on anything, which is why all my sources are always in the description, but I'll try my best to explain. The main proponents of the Solutrean hypothesis, Bradley and Stanford, comment that the material cultures feature similarities in how some of the tools are produced. Both Clovis and Solutrean bifaces, for example, feature evidence of overshot flaking. However, visually you can see that they produced them in two different styles. The Solutrean produced leaf-shaped spear tips, the Clovis had a distinctive flute at the bottom which has never been found at a Solutrean site. Solutrians also produced a lot of bone and microlithic points. Some Solutrean sites, these make up 40% of the artifacts. These are much rarer or even totally absent in Clovis sites. If these two cultures are related, why such variation in style and material? Critics argue that just because stone tools are made in the same way, it doesn't mean that these cultures are connected. This sort of hyper-diffusionist view of archaeology and world history has really wildly fallen out of favour. Because after all, there are only so many ways to make a spear. It's entirely possible that two groups of people can think of the same way independently. If that's the only evidence of a, a cross-cultural connection, they probably weren't connected. The Solutrean and Clovis people made far more than just bifaces though. They produced art and culture. The Solutrians in particular made huge cave paintings and engravings. These are totally absent in America. How can we explain that if these two cultures are connected? Why would they abandon their form of artistic expression when they arrived in the Americas? The earliest Clovis sites that everyone can agree on date to around 13,400 years ago, whereas the Solutrian had died out, had disappeared, had evolved into a new culture by 17 to 18,000 years ago. That's 5,000 years that are missing. How do we explain this huge gap in time? Advocates of the Solutrean hypothesis point to excavations from the coast around Chesapeake Bay to try and bridge this gap. However, these are controversial for several reasons. The tool to kickstart the modern Solutrean hypothesis and the one that sits on the cover of Bradley and Stanford's book was discovered in 1970 and was dredged up off the seabed along with pieces of a mastodon skull and tusk. Collagen in the tusk was dated accurately to 22,760 years ago. However, its association with the stone tip is really questionable. No one would say that being dredged up from the seabed are the perfect conditions for dating. Everyone knows the perfect date is Nando's. Other points found along the coast of Chesapeake Bay are also questionable. 
First, critics are not sure they were found in their original undisturbed context. Second, they are of a similar style to points produced by later Native Americans around 5,000 years ago. The biggest problem with all of these tools though is that four out of the five radiocarbon dates taken around them actually predate the Salutrian by thousands of years. So according to the hypothesis, if similarities in the tools are evidence of a transatlantic connection, shouldn't we be saying the Salutrian was therefore a result of Native Americans traveling to Europe? As you can see, the dating of these artifacts and the conclusions drawn from them are really open to debate. And if that is the case, we have to look outside of the stones for further supporting evidence, such as climatic and geographical data, and of course, genetics. For the Salutrian to work as hypothesized, it really requires an unbroken bridge of ice between Europe and North America. However, recent climate studies have cast doubt on the existence of this ice bridge, and if it did exist, it might not be how we envisage it. It seems that during the last glacial maximum, Europe and North America may have only been connected by ice for one to three months of the year, basically just during the winter. It was probably not a solid piece of ice, but rather a huge dynamic ocean of icebergs. Ocean currents were slowly moving these south and east, the exact opposite direction the Salutrian hunters would have needed to move in. The Bay of Biscay, the Salutrian's backyard, may have only had sea ice for just one month of the year, not much time to develop and adapt a new ocean-faring way of life. Furthermore, broken up sea ice and icebergs is not the preferred habitat of animals like seals and walruses, so what would the Salutrians have hunted on this journey across the ice? These are pretty difficult criticisms to overcome, let's face it. Also, if the Salutrians were so well adapted to life on the edge of the ice, then why did their culture only extend as far as central France? Why are there no Salutrian sites in the UK, Ireland, or northern France? For sure, these were exceptionally cold places, but if they were so well adapted they could live off the ice, we'd at least have some artifacts from this far north. Meanwhile in America, the earliest clover site that we have so far, dated to 13,400 years ago, Alfin del Mundo, is in western Mexico. That's the exact opposite side of the country you would think the first clover site would be if they were descended from a group of people who had arrived from Europe. You would expect to find it in Canada, the northeast USA, not western Mexico. All right, so this subject is a little bit complicated. I'm no archaeologist. I'm certainly no geneticist. If you feel that I've made a hash of explaining this or it's piqued your interest, check out the sources below, in particular an article written by Jennifer Raff, a geneticist here in the USA. She gives a great overview of how the genetics do not support the Salutrian hypothesis. It's open access. Anyone can read it. Check it out. But now here's my layman's explanation. At first glance, the genetics seems to support the Salutrian hypothesis. There are five main haplogroups that Native Americans have. Four of them, we have found their origins in Northeast Asia, but one we haven't, X2A. Over in Europe, X haplogroup is also present, and there's a particularly large grouping of it in Northern Scotland, in the Hebrides. That's where you would expect a sort of jumping off point for the Salutrian hypothesis to take place. So on the surface, it seems that these are connected, but scratch beneath that, and these connections quickly unravel. First, X2A is only found in the Americas, not in Europe or in Asia. The form of haplogroup X found in Europe is not ancestral to X2A. They share an extremely distant ancestor, but one is not ancestral to the other. It shouldn't surprise us that Native Americans and Europeans share some degree of common ancestor. During the Paleolithic, groups that live in North Eurasia spread both east and west, contributing to the genetics of Europeans, Asians, and eventually Native Americans. Equally plausible, the arrival of haplogroup X in Europe could be a result of the Neolithic Revolution, as it is also found most commonly in the Middle East. It's hard for us to say because we don't have any genomes sequenced from any Salutrian people. We have no idea if the Salutrians even carried haplogroup X. The oldest individual found with haplogroup X2A, the Kennewick Man, was not found on the East Coast but on the West in Washington State. 
After a lengthy legal battle, his DNA was analyzed. It showed no evidence of European ancestry whatsoever. He is most closely related to modern Native Americans, particularly the Colville tribe who still inhabit the area. The latest genetic evidence suggests the peopling of the Americas was one rapid event involving a population that contained all five of the main haplogroups. Around 23,000 years ago, the ancestors of Native Americans were cut off from their Asian relatives and experienced a sharp population decline to perhaps 1,000 women, maybe even less. I mean, I'm sure there were some men in there too, but 1,000 women or less. The most likely explanation is that a population in Beringia was cut off from Asia by the last glacial maximum. We can see in the genetics that between 19 and 15,000 years ago, this population rapidly expanded. Again, the most likely explanation is that as the ice retreated and the weather improved, the Beringians exploited the new continent of America that had just opened up for them. Now that's not to say we know everything. A recent DNA study of people in Brazil found that the Surui and other Amazonian groups share some ancestry with modern Australasians. The most likely explanation is that this is either a false positive, basically a mistake, or that the ancient Beringian population was more diverse than we had originally thought. Finally, to bring this back to the Clovis, over here in America, there's only been one body found in association with Clovis tools, and that's a child found in Montana called Anzic 1. Their DNA was analyzed, and they are found to have no European ancestry whatsoever. Now we can only make our hypotheses on the evidence we have, not on what we wished we had. If the only body found next to Clovis tools has no European ancestry, that's pretty damning for the Salutrian hypothesis. So that's it. That's my take on the Salutrian hypothesis. I'm no fan. I believe these hurdles are huge. These criticisms are valid. And there's a lot more evidence that would be, need to be collected to prove the Salutrian hypothesis right. I personally can't see how the genetic evidence in particular will ever support it. I mean, we don't know everything. Who knows what future discoveries will discover. But uh, as it stands, Native Americans don't have European ancestry. I'm not one of these people that believes a population can be wiped out. The Clovis spread from central Mexico to the north of the USA to Quebec. <laughs> Quebec's in Canada. So that's a huge area. I can't believe in an area that size people can be wiped out without any any hanky-panky, okay? Someone at some point is going to sleep with someone else and it's going to leave a genetic legacy. The absence of that is really damning. Thanks for watching, guys. That's all I've got on the Salutrian hypothesis. See ya.